All right, this is a very popular problem that occurs in a Calculus 2 course, Integral Calculus course, where you take a, a wedge out of some type of pipe or log or something like that. It's pretty apropos for this time of year, which is uh, January for me right now. Um, I have a bunch of trees on my property and we have to cut, they, they've all kind of, a lot of them have fallen. So we're chopping them down at this point, trying to cut through them. And so you do these types of, of wedged cuts to help you cut a tree down. Um, what's interesting is actually you could, if you know the volume of such a wedge cut, you can find out how much energy you can get from burning such a slice. So the interest here is that we are going to go ahead and, uh, take, um, this wedge cut and find out how much energy or not energy i'm sorry but how, how much volume we have and of, of course subsequently we can compute how much energy is used in burning it if we wanted to it's a log of radius r so let me go ahead and draw that in i'll use red uh, to draw in the radius here so let me get that in there so a little radius r all right. And the hardest thing for me when I was a student is trying to figure out how to draw this wedge. The wedge cut is the worst possible thing for me to draw. I'm a terrible artist. I've mentioned that before, but um, the wedge cut is really just a toughie. But really to get this problem right and started correctly, uh, you do need to kind of have a pretty good uh, hand at drawing. So I'm going to tilt this and redraw it. The trick here is to start, for me personally, I start with this upright cylinder here, and I'm gonna draw a diameter going through behind the scenes. So I'm gonna draw a diameter kind of coming through here through the central axis. And then this diameter, I'm gonna go ahead and cut uh, so that you can imagine this goes from one side of the log to the other side of the log. And I'll just draw an arc going up through this. So I'll arc this up just like that. And then arc it back down. Okay. And that's gonna make a, um, actually the way the wedge cut looks here. We'll have a 90 degree angle in between these. So I've, I've kind of slightly under exaggerated this cut. It's not that big of a deal, but they will be, if there's a horizontal piece here, this is going to be 45 degrees. And there'll be another 45 degree piece that we're going to have here in a moment. And honestly, I don't actually need the lower cut. I could just double up this upper cut and call it good, right? So I could just consider um, the slices for only half of this um, and not worry about the uh, other half. But we still need to visualize what these cuts look like. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a side view of this. And again, just because I don't need to, I'm going to double up the volume in the long run. I'm going to go ahead and just consider that we are cutting like this. So we're going to take a wedge out of this, like that's a 45 degree angle wedge out. And it'll be a straight cut down. And so <clears throat> if we do that, um, I'm going to go ahead and, again, I tend to redraw quite a bit when I do stuff like this. So I'll redraw slightly. Oops. Okay, this is kind of what it looks like. I mean, if you're generous with um, your forgiveness on my... Uh, drawing capabilities. This is always a 90 degree angle there, at least. I do know that. Um, but one thing you should note is that each of these slices, so um, I know that I'm cutting in, uh, really, if I lay the log down like this, I'm really cutting uh, downward and I'm taking out chunks, right, like that. But using calculus, I'm not going to do that. Instead, using calculus, I'm going to go ahead and if you can imagine this pipe laying on top of or this log laying on uh, in front of your screen, if you just take sliver slices like paper thin slices starting at the very front of this wedge and going all the way to the back of the wedge, all those paper thin slices look like this. The first one looks really small, but it looks like that. And the second one looks slightly larger. 
looks like that. And the second one looks slightly larger. It looks like that. And so on and so forth. They get really large until you get halfway through the log and it gets to its largest triangle that you have there. And then it starts to shrink down in size. And unfortunately, I can't do that without doing it like this. But it shrinks down in size. So you get these ever increasing and ever decreasing um triangles that you're getting here now because i'm not going to do the entire thing i'm only worried about half of this um my slices are not going to look like um equilateral triangles instead they're just going to be uh, uh right triangles um, so each of my slices will look something like this uh, so the first slice will be very very small um again if if i've tilted the log like this um, and you don't have to tilt it like this. I'm just tilting it like this to showcase it. But the very first slice will be a nice thing, triangle like that. And the next slice will be slightly larger. The next slice will be slightly whoops, larger. And so on and so forth until you get halfway through. And when you're halfway through, you have the largest paper thin slice. But they're all still 45, 45, 90s. Right, because remember, this is supposed to be a 90 degree angle here, so they're all 45, 45, 90s, and that's that's going to be important. Okay, <clears throat> so the hardest part of a problem like this is really the geometry of studying up how are those slices going to look, and you have to be a good geometric thinker uh, to and have a good spatial thinking skills to kind of be able to do this. Um, otherwise, it's, it's it can be very challenging. So now we have to. We have to figure out how are we going to uh, somehow magically um, uh, do this. Well, uh, you have to imagine some way of getting the circular shape of the log involved. The log does have a circular shape. It's of radius R. And so um, we need to kind of bring that into play. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab this log and I'm going to tilt it to where it's facing us, to where the circular portion is facing us. So let me grab this and I'm going to draw the log on its side, but it's facing us direct, head on. So let me change pens here and uh, put a circle out. Okay, there's the, I think that's a circle. Yep, that's the log facing us head on. Okay, now remember, we're actually, if you look at this log, if I just tilt it this way and then face it toward us we will have this axis that we have a central axis let me go ahead and draw this in here and we are taking these paper thin slices starting at one side and going all the way to the other side and if you can hear some rattling in the background it's just because there's a heavy storm going on up in my neck of the woods so each of these paper thin slices is going to be a triangle. In fact, a 45, 45, 90 triangle, each one of these ones that I've drawn. So again, facing me, I will have every single step of the way for that slice, I'll have a little sliver and another little sliver and another little sliver and so on and so forth. And each of these slivers because we're seeing them face on, so it doesn't look like a triangle face on, but each of these slivers is a triangle, okay? It's one of these guys here, all right? So I'm going to look at the ith sliver. So here we'll call that the ith slice. You always want to create a, a random slice, an arbitrary slice. So that ith slice, what does it look like? Well, first of all, I should probably define a formula for the border on this circle. And since this circle is an R, a radius R circle, a formula for that would be X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. So we have at least a little bit of math linked into this. And the ith slice, we want to know its volume. So the volume of the ith slice, let's see, the volume of the ith slice is equal to um, let's see, it's uh, area, right? We have a surface area for this slice. Let me shade in the slice here. It's kind of hard for me to shade, but I'm going to shade in this slice. It has a surface area, but you can't see it. If I were to grab that slice and try to showcase the surface area to you, 
I would have to, well, let me grab it. I'll move it out of here. Okay. The pointiest part, according to our picture here, the pointiest part is actually along this diameter. So this pointy part that I'm going to draw right here is where the diameter is. That's this diameter. Okay. But otherwise, the slice looks just like this. Well, sort of like this. Where there's a 90 there. Okay. And this is a 45. And this is a 45. All right. So let's think about this now that I've called this formula x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. The width of that slice is a delta x, isn't it? It's a wiggle in the x direction. And the length here, which is this length here, is a y value. It's the y value at that moment. So I'm going to put y sub i here. Well, if it's a 45, 45, 90, then the other side also must be of length y sub i, right? Because they have to be of equal length. So there we have that. It's not so bad, actually. So let's go ahead and put this together. The volume of that slice, well, the volume of, an, of that triangle is going to be one half the base times the height. So I'm going to write those in words first, as a habit I always have. It's my dog flapping her ears in the background. One half base height, that's the surface area of that slice. And then, of course, the width we said was delta x. Now the base is going to be y sub i, the height of that slice is y sub i. So I'll fill those in. And I don't know why I'm sticking with red here. I'm going to actually change out the black here. So it's one half the base again was y sub i. The height was y sub i. And again, we're dealing with delta x. Well, we're almost done here. That's y sub i squared, one half y sub i squared delta x. All I need now is to uh, recall that when I add these volumes up, that's just the volume of this shaded, red shaded slice, but I want all of them, so I'm going to need an integral for that. And when I use an integral, I need the variables to be identical. I need this x and this right here to be the same, so I need to tr trade out y for x. Luckily, I have a formula that tells me what y is in terms of x. This guy right here, that describes the boundary of our region. That's where our triangle touches. So all the x values are related to the y values by the formula x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Or in other words, y squared is the same thing as r squared minus x squared. So I'm going to trade out my y squared here for an r squared minus x sub i squared. So it's a one half quantity r squared minus x sub i squared, again, delta x. And often students will say, "What? why do I have to worry about that sub i on the x? Well, actually you do, because this is um, an x value in the ith slice. And so it's important that you use the x sub i notation, because you're still working with um, a an arbitrary element of the ith interval. Um, and that's just how we, we uh, notate that. Anyhow, moving into the integral, the total volume of the wedge is going to equal the integral from x equals something to x equals something else. I'll fill in those in a moment. Of one half quantity r squared minus x squared dx. Now, that's actually not true because we are actually, this uh, formula that I'm dealing with is only computing the volume of the half wedge. That's kind of easy to forget. Um, so always look back at the beginning of the problem. Note here that I actually want the full slice out. I wanted not just this half wedge, but I wanted the full wedge. So we're going to go ahead and multiply that by 2, which is perfect because it'll get rid of the 1 half. Also, we need to know where do our x values start and where do our x values end? Well, uh, one way to think about it is that you're going from 
one side of this circle to the other slicing. Well, remember, this is zero, and this goes from negative r to positive r. But the reality is, uh, the all the slices on the left half of this circle are going to be the same as all the slices in the right half. So you really don't need to integrate from negative r to r if you don't want to. You can integrate from 0 to r and double it up. So you can take this region here, find out what is the volume of all those little slices in that region, double it up, and I'll give you all this over here, and then finally double again so you get the other side of the wedge. So in reality, if you integrate from 0 to r, you will have to again, and I'll make some space here so I can do this, you'll have to again double your result. One doubling is because uh, all of our work is based upon only the half wedge, and the other doubling is because even with the half wedges, we're only worried about working from zero over to R, and we'll go ahead and double that volume, and it'll give us all the stuff shaded right here, okay? So let's go ahead and do this mathematics. That gives me two. Uh, the Now, I, I should take my time here because there's a little bit of a, um, a question mark that's going to happen for some people. So I'm going to take my time and just do this. Uh, when you take the antiderivative of a little r squared, that becomes a little r squared x, right? Because the variable of integration, there's a 2 in front of it, is x. So it goes from 0 to r. And then minus 2x cubed over 3, and that's evaluated again from 0 to r. And when you do this computation, you will get 2r cubed minus 2 thirds r cubed, and that looks to be 4 thirds r cubed. That will work actually for any uh, any log of radius uh, of any radius you want. Actually, so at this point, that's a, a pretty good example of um, the wedge cutting scenario.